Economy from Walden by Henry David Thoreau. When I wrote the following pages, or rather the bulk of them, I lived alone in the woods, a mile from any neighbor, in a house which I'd built myself on the shore of Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts, and earned my living by the labor of my hands only. I lived there two years and two months. At present, I may sojourner in civilized life again. I should not obtrude my affairs so much on the notice of my readers if very particular inquiries had not been made by my townsmen concerning my mode of life, which some would call impertinent, although they do not appear to me at all impertinent, but considering the circumstances, very natural and pertinent. Some have asked what I got to eat, if I did not feel lonesome, if I was not afraid, and the like. Others have been curious to learn what portion of my income I devoted to charitable purposes, and some who have large families, how many poor children I maintained. I will therefore ask those of my readers who feel no particular interest in me to pardon me if I undertake to answer some of these questions in this book. In most books, the I or first person is omitted. In this, it will be retained. That in respect to egotism is the main difference. We commonly do not remember that it is, after all, always the first person that is speaking. I should not talk so much about myself if there were anybody else whom I knew as well. Unfortunately, I'm confined to this theme by the narrowness of my experience. Moreover, I, on my side, require of every writer, first or last, a simple and sincere account of his own life, and not merely what he has heard of other men's lives. Some such account as he would send his kindred from a distant land. For if he's lived sincerely, it must have been a, in a distant land to me. Perhaps his pages are more particularly addressed to poor students. As for the rest of my readers, they will accept such portions as apply to them. I trust that none will stretch the seams in putting on the coat, for it may do good service to him whom it fits. I would fain say something, not so much concerning the Chinese and Sandwich Islanders as you who read these pages, who are said to live in New England. Something about your condition, especially your outward condition or circumstances in this world, in this town, what it is, whether it's necessary that it be as bad as, as it is, whether it cannot be improved as well as not. I've traveled a good deal in Concord, and everywhere, in shops, in offices, in fields, the inhabitants have appeared to me to be doing penance in a thousand remarkable ways. What I've heard of Brahmins sitting exposed to four fires and looking in the face of the sun, or hanging suspended with their heads downward over flames, or looking at the heavens over their shoulders until it becomes impossible for them to resume their natural position, while from the twist of the neck nothing but liquids can pass into the stomach, or dwelling chained for life at the foot of a tree, or measuring with their bodies like caterpillars the breadth of vast empires, or standing on one leg on the tops of pillars, even these forms of conscious penance are hardly more incredible and astonishing than the scenes which I daily witness. The twelve labors of Hercules were trifling in comparison with those which my neighbors have undertaken, for they were only twelve and had an end. But I could never see that these men slew or captured any monster or finished any labor. They have no friend Aeolus to burn with a hot iron the root of the hydra's head, but as soon as one head is crushed up, two spring up. I see young men, my townsmen, whose misfortune it is to have inherited farms, houses, barns, cattle, and farming tools, for these are more easily acquired than got rid of. Better if they have been born in the open pasture and suckled by a wolf, that they might have seen with clearer eyes what field they were called to labor in. Who made them serfs of the soil? Why should they eat their sixty acres when a man is condemned to eat only his peck of dirt? Why should they begin digging their graves as soon as they're born? They've got to live a man's life, pushing all these things before them, and get on as well as they can. How many a poor immortal soul have I met with nigh crushed and smothered under its load, creeping down the road of life, pushing before it a barn seventy-five feet by forty, its Augean stables never cleansed, and one hundred acres of land, tillage, mowing, pasture, and woodlot. The portionless who struggle with no such unnecessary inherited encumbrances find it labor enough to subdue and cultivate a few cubic feet of flesh. But men labor under mistake. The better part of the man is soon plowed into the soil for the compost. By a seeming fate, commonly called necessity, they are employed, as it says in an old book, laying up treasures which moth and rust will corrupt and thieves will break through and steal. It is a fool's life, as they will find when they get to the end of it, if not before. 
It is said that Deucalion and Pyrrha created men by throwing stones over their heads behind them. Or, as Raleigh rhymes in his sonorous way, from thence our kind heart it is, enduring pain and care, approving that our bodies of a stony nature are. So much for a blind obedience to a blundering oracle, throwing the stones over their heads behind them and not seeing where they fell. Most men, even in this comparatively free country, though mere ignorance and mistake, are so occupied with factitious cases and superfluously coarse labors of life that its finer fruits cannot be plucked by them. Their fingers from excessive toil are too clumsy and tremble too much for that. Actually, the laboring man has not leisure for a true integrity day by day. He cannot afford to sustain the manliest relations to men. His labor would be depreciated in the market. He has no time to be anything but a machine. How can he remember well his ignorance, which his growth requires, who has so often to use his knowledge? We should feed and clothe him gratuitous, gratuitously sometimes, and recruit him with our cordials before we judge of him. The finest qualities of our nature, like the bloom on fruits, can be preserved only by the most delicate handling. Yet we do not treat ourselves, nor one another, thus tenderly. Some of you we all know are poor, find it hard to live, are sometimes, as it were, gasping for breath. I have no doubt that some of you who read this book are unable to pay for all the dinners which you've actually eaten, or for the coats and shoes which are fast wearing or are already worn out, and have come to this page to spend borrowed or stolen time robbing your creditors of an hour. It is very evident what mean and sneaking lives many of you live, for my sight has been wetted by experience. Always on the limits, trying to get into the business and trying to get out of debt, a very ancient sloth, called by the Latins os an alienum, another's brass, for some of their coins were made of brass, still living and dying and buried by this other's brass, always compromising to pay, promising to pay tomorrow and dying today insolvent, seeking to curry favor, to get custom, by how many modes, only not state prison offenses, lying, flattering, voting, contracting yourselves into a nutshell of civility or dilating into an atmosphere of thin and vaporous generosity, that you may persuade your neighbor to let you make his shoes, or his hat, or his coat, or his carriage, or import his groceries for him, making yourselves sick, that you may lay up something against a sick day, something to be tucked away in an old chest or in a stocking behind the plastering, or more safely in the brick bank, no matter where, no matter how much, or how little. I sometimes wonder that we can be so frivolous. I may almost say as to attend to the gross but somewhat foreign form of the servitude called slavery. There are so many keen and subtle masters that enslave both North and South. It is hard to have a Southern overseer. It is worse to have a Northern one. But worst of all, when you are the slave driver of yourself. Talk of a divinity in man. Look at the teamster on the highway, wending to market by day or night. Does any divinity stir within him? its highest duty to fodder and water his horses. What is his destiny to him compared with the shipping interests? Does he not drive for Squire Megaster? How godlike, how immortal is he? See how he cowers and sneaks, how vaguely all the day he fears, not being immortal or divine, but the slave and prisoner of his own opinion of himself, a fame won by his own deeds. Public opinion is a weak tyrant, compared with our own private opinion. What a man thinks of himself, that is which determines or rather indicates his fate. Self-emancipation, even in the West Indian provinces of the fancy and imagination. What Wilbur Force is there to bring that about? Think also of the ladies of the land weaving toilet cushions against the last day, not to betray too green an interest in their fates. As if you could kill time without injuring eternity. The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. From the desperate city you go into the desperate country and have to console yourself with the bravery of minks and muskrats. A stereotyped but unconscious despair is concealed even under what are called the games and amusements of mankind. There is no play in them for this comes after work. But it is a characteristic of wisdom not to do desperate things. When we consider what, to use our words of the catechism, is the chief end of man, and what are the true necess necess necessaries and means of life, 
It appears as if men had deliberately chosen the common mode of living because they preferred it to any other. Yet they honestly think there is no choice left, but alert and healthy natures remember that the sun rose clear. It is never too late to give up our prejudices. No way of thinking or doing, however ancient, can be trusted without proof. What everybody echoes or in silence passes by as true today may turn out to be falsehood tomorrow. Mere smoke of opinion, which some had trusted for a cloud that would sprinkle fertilizing rain on their fields. What old people say you cannot do, you try to find what you can. Old deeds for old people and new deeds for new. Old people did not know enough once, perchance, to fetch fresh fuel to keep the fire a-going. New people put a little dry wood under a pot and are whirled round the globe with the speed of birds, in a way to kill old people, as the phrase is. Age is no better, hardly so well, qualified for an instructor as youth, for it is not profited so much as it's lost. One may almost doubt if the wisest man has learned anything of absolute value by living. Practically, the old have no very important advice to give the young. Their own experience has been so partial, and their lives have been such miserable failures for private reasons, as they must believe. And it may be that they have some faith left which belies that experience, and they're only less young than they were. I've lived some thirty years on this planet, and I have yet to hear the first syllable of valuable or even earnest advice from my seniors. They have told me nothing, and probably cannot tell me anything to the purpose. Here is life, an experiment to a great extent untried by me. But it does not avail me that they have tried it. If I have any experience which I think valuable, I am sure to reflect that this my mentors said nothing about. One farmer says to me, You cannot live on vegetable food solely, for it furnishes nothing to make bones with. And so, he religiously devotes a part of his day to supplying his system with the raw material of bones. Walking all the while, he talks behind his oxen, which with vegetable-made bones jerk him and his lumbering plow along in spite of every obstacle. Some things are really necessaries of life in some circles, the most helpless and diseased, which in others are luxuries merely, and in others still are entirely unknown. The whole ground of human life seems to have have been gone over by their predecessors, with the heights and the valleys and all things to have been cared for. According to Evelyn, the wise Solomon prescribed ordinances for the very distances of trees, and the Roman praetors have decided how often you may go into your neighbor's land to gather the acorns which fall on it without trespass, and what share belongs to that neighbor. Hippocrates has even left directions on how we should cut our nails. That is, even with the ends of the fingers, neither shorter nor longer. Undoubtedly, the very tedium and ennui which presume to have exhausted the variety and the joys of life are as old as Adam. But a man's capacities have never been measured. Nor are we to judge of what he can do by any precedence. So little has been tried. Whatever have been thy failures hitherto, be not afflicted, my child, for who shall assign to thee what thou hast left undone? We might try our lives by a thousand simple tests, as, for instance, that same sun which ripens my beans illumines at once a system of earths like ours. If I'd remembered this, it would have prevented some mistakes. This was not the light in which I hoed them. The stars are the apexes of what wonderful triangles. What distant and different beings in the various mansions of the universe are contemplating the same one at the same moment? Nature and human life are as various as our several constitutions. Who shall say what prospect life offers to another? Could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes for an instant? We should live in all the ages of the world in an hour, I in all the worlds of the ages. History, poetry, mythology. I know of no reading of another's experience so startling and informing as this would be. The greater part of what my neighbors call good, I believe in my soul to be bad, and if I repent of anything, it is very likely to be my good behavior. What demon possessed me that I behaved so well? You may say the wisest thing you can, old man. You who've lived seventy years, not without honor of a kind, I hear an irresistible voice which invites me away from all that. One generation abandons the enterprises of another like stranded vessels. I think we may safely trust a good deal more than we do. We may waive just so much care of ourselves as we honestly bestow elsewhere. Nature is as well adapted to our weakness as to our strength. The incessant anxiety and strain of some is a well-nigh incurable form of disease. 
We are made to exaggerate the importance of what work we do. And yet, how much is not done by us? Or what if we'd been taken sick? How vigilant we are, determined not to live by faith if we can avoid it, all day long on the alert, and at night we unwillingly say our prayers and commit ourselves to uncertainties. So thoroughly and sincerely are we compelled to live, reverencing our life and denying the possibility of change. This is the only way, we say, but there is as many ways as there can be drawn radii from one center. All change is a miracle to contemplate, but it is a miracle which is taking place every instant. Confucius said, to know what, that we know what we know, and that we do not know what we do not know, that is true knowledge. When one man has reduced a fact of the imagination to be a fact to his understanding, I foresee that all men at length establish their lives on that basis. Let us consider for a moment what most of the trouble and anxiety which I've referred to is about, and how much it is necessary that we be troubled or at least careful. It would be some advantage to live a primitive and frontier life, though in the midst of an outward civilization, if only to learn what are the gross necessaries of life and what methods have been taken to obtain them, or even to look over the old day books of the merchants, to see what it was that men most commonly bought at the stores, what they stored, that is, what are the grossest groceries? For the improvements of ages have had but little influence on the essential laws of man's existence, as our skeletons probably are not to be distinguished from those of our ancestors. By the words necessary of life, I mean whatever of all that man obtains by his own exertions has been from the first or from long use has become so important to human life that few, if any, whether from savageness or poverty or philosophy, ever attempt to do without it. To many creatures, there is in this sense but one necessary of life, food. To the bison of the prairie, it is a few inches of palatable grass with water to drink, unless he seeks the shelter of the forest or the mountain's shadow. None of the brute creation requires more than food and shelter. The necessaries of life for man in this climate may accurately enough be distributed under the several heads of food, shelter, clothing, and fuel. For not till we have secured these are we prepared to entertain the true problems of life with freedom and a pros prospect of success. Man has invented not only houses, but clothes and cooked food, and possibly from the accidental discovery of the warmth of fire and the consequent use of it, at first a luxury, arose the present necess necessity to sit by it. We observe cats and dogs acquiring the same second nature. By proper shelter and clothing, we legitimately retain our own internal heat. But with an excess of these, or a fuel that is, with an external heat greater than our own internal, may not cookery properly be said to begin? Darwin the naturalist says of the inhabitants of Tierra del Fuego that while his own party, who were all well clothed and sitting close to a fire, were far from too warm, these naked savages who were farther off were observed, to his great surprise, to be streaming with perspiration at undergoing such a roasting. So we are told the New Hollander goes naked with impunity, while the European shivers in his clothes. Is it impossible to combine the hardiness of these savages with the intellectualness of the civilized man? According to Liebig, man's body is a stove, and food the fuel which keeps the internal combustion in the lungs. In cold weather, we eat more. In warm, less. The animal heat is the result of a slow combustion, and disease and death take place when this is too rapid, or for want of fuel, or from some defect in the draught, the fire goes out. Of course, the vital heat is not to be confounded with fire, but so much for an analogy. It appears, therefore, from the above list that the expression animal life is nearly synonymous with the expression animal heat. For while food may be regarded as the fuel which keeps up the fire within us, and fuel serves only to prepare that food or to increase the warmth of our bodies by addition from without, shelter and clothing also serve only to retain the heat thus generated and absorbed. Grand necessity, then, for our bodies is to keep warm, to keep the vital heat in us. What pains we accordingly take, not only with our food and clothing and shelter, but with our beds, which are our night clothes, robbing the nests and breasts of birds to prepare the shelter within a shelter, as the mole has its bed of grass and leaves at the end of its burrow. The poor man is wont to complain that this is a cold world, and to cold no less physical than social 
we refer directly a great part of our ails. The summer, in some climates, makes possible to man a sort of Elysian life. Fuel, except to cook his food, is then unnecessary. The sun is his fire, and many of the fruits are sufficiently cooked by its rays, while food generally is more various or more easily obtained, and clothing and shelter are wholly or half unnecessary. At the present day and in this country, as I find by my own experience, a few implements, a knife, an axe, a spade, a wheelbarrow, etc., and for the studious lamplight stationery and access to a few books, rank next to necessaries, and can all be obtained at a trifling cost. Yet some not wise go to the other side of the globe, to barbarous and unhealthy regions, and devote themselves to trade for ten or twenty years in order that they may live, that is, keep comfortably warm, and die in New England at last. The luxuriously rich are not simply kept comfortably warm, but unnaturally hot. As I implied before, they are cooked, of course, a la mode. Most of the luxuries and many of the so-called comforts of life are only not indispensable, but positive hindrances to the elevation of mankind. With respect to luxuries and comforts, the wisest have ever lived a more simple and meager life than the poor. The ancient philosophers, Chinese, Hindu, Persian, and Greek, were a class than which were none has been poorer in outward riches and none so rich in inward. We know not much about them. It is remarkable that we know so much of them as we do. The same is true of the more modern reformers and benefactors of the race. None can be an impartial or wise observer of human life, but from the vantage ground of what we should call voluntary poverty. Of a life of luxury, the fruit is luxury, whether in agriculture or commerce or literature or arts. There are nowadays professors of philosophy, but not philosophers. Yet it is admirable to profess because it was once admirable to live. To be a philosopher is not merely to have subtle thoughts, nor even to found a school, but so to love wisdom as to live according to its dictates, a life of simplicity, independence, magnanimity, and trust. It is to solve some of the problems of life, not only theoretically, but practically. The success of great scholars and thinkers is commonly a courtier-like success, not kingly and not manly. They make shift to live merely by conformity, practically as their fathers did, and are in no sense the progenitors of a nobler race of men. But why do men degenerate ever? What makes families run out? What is the nature of the luxury which enervates and destroys nations? Are we sure that there's none of it in our own lives? The philosopher is in advance of his age even in the outward form of his life. He is not fed, sheltered, clothed, warmed like his contemporaries. How can a man be a philosopher and not maintain his vital heat by better methods than other men? When a man is worn by the several modes which I have described, what does he want next? Surely not more warmth of the same kind as more and richer food, larger and more splendid houses, finer and more abundant clothing, more numerous incessant and hotter fires and the like. When he has obtained those things which are necessary to life, there is another alternative than to obtain the super, super fluidities, and that is to adventure on life now, his vacation from humbler toil having commenced. The soil, it appears, is suited to the seed, for it sent its radical downward and may now send its shoot upwards also with confidence. Why has man rooted himself thus firmly in the earth, but that he may rise to the same proportion into the heavens above? For the nobler plants are valued for the fruit they bear at last in the air and light, far from the ground and are not treated like the humbler esculents, which though they may be biennials, are cultivated only till they have perfected their root, and often cut down at top for this purpose, so that most would not know them in their flowering season. I do not mean to prescribe rules to strong and valiant natures who will mind their own affairs whether in heaven or in hell, and perchance build more magnificently and spend more lavishly than the richest, without ever impoverishing themselves, not knowing how they live. If indeed there are any as such as had been dreamed, nor to those who find their encouragement and inspiration in the precisely the present condition of things, and cherish it with the fondness and enthusiasm of lovers. And, to some extent, I reckon myself in this number. I do not speak to those who are well employed in whatever circumstances, and they know whether they are well employed or not, but mainly to the mass of men who are discontented, 
and idly complaining of the hardness of their lot or of their times when they might improve them. There are some who complain most energetically and inconsolably of any, because they are, as they say, doing their duty. I also have in my mind that seemingly wealthy but most terribly impoverished class of all, who have accumulated dross but do not know how to use it or get rid of it, and thus have forged their own golden or silver fetters. If I should attempt to tell how I have desired to spend my life in years past, it would probably surprise those of my readers who are somewhat acquainted with its actual history. It would certainly astonish those who know nothing about it. I will only hint at some of the enterprises which I have cherished. In any weather, at any hour of the day or night, I have been anxious to improve the nick of time, and notch it on my stick too, to stand on the meeting of two eternities, the past and future, which is precisely the present moment, to toe that line. You will pardon some obscurities, for there are more secrets in my trade than in most men's, and yet not voluntarily kept, but inseparable from its very nature. I would gladly tell all that I know about it, and never paint no admittance on my gates. Long ago I lost a hound, a bay horse, and a turtle dove, and am still on their trail. Many are the travelers I have spoken concerning them, describing their tracks and what calls they answered to. I have met one or two who have heard the hound and the tramp of the horse, and even seen the dove disappear behind the cloud, and they seemed anxious to recover them as if they had lost them themselves. To anticipate, not the sunrise and the dawn merely, but if possible, nature herself. How many mornings, summer and winter, before yet any neighbor was stirring about his business have I been about mine? No doubt many of my townsmen have met me returning from this enterprise, farmers starting for Boston in the twilight, or woodchoppers going to their work. It is true, I never assisted the sun materially in his rising, but doubt not, it was of the last importance only to be present at it. So many autumn, I, and winter days spent outside the town, trying to hear what was in the wind, to hear and carry it express. I well nigh sunk all my capital in it, and lost my own breath into the bargain, running in the face of it. If it had concerned either of the political parties, depend upon it, it would have appeared in the Gazette with the earliest intelligence. At other times, watching from the observatory of some cliff or tree, to telegraph any new arrival, or waiting that evening on the hilltops for the sky to fall, that I might catch something, though I never caught much, and that, manna-wise, would dissolve again in the sun. For a long time I was a reporter to a journal, of no very wide circulation, whose editor has never yet seen fit to print the bulk of my contributions, and as too common with writers, I got only my labor for my pains. However, in this case, my pains were their own reward. For many years I was self-appointed inspector of snowstorms and rainstorms, did my duty faithfully, surveyor, if not of highways, then of forest paths, and all across lot routes keeping them open and ravines bridged and passable at all seasons, where the public heel had testified to their utility. I have looked after the wild stock of the town, which give a faithful herdsman a good deal of trouble by leaping fences. And I've had an eye to the unfrequented nooks and corners of the farm, though I did not always know whether Jonas or Solomon worked in a particular field today. That was none of my business. I've watered the red huckleberry, the sand cherry and the nettle tree, the red pine and the black ash the white grape, and the yellow violet, which might have withered else in dry seasons. In short, I went on thus for a long time, I may see it without boasting, faithfully minding my business till it became more and more evident that my townsmen would not, after all, admit me into the list of town offices, nor make me at my place a sinecure with moderate allowance. My accounts, which I can swear to have kept faithfully, I have indeed never got audited, still less accepted, still less paid, and settled. However, I have not my set, set my heart on that. Not long since, a strolling Indian went to sell baskets at the house of a well-known lawyer in my neighborhood. Do you wish to buy any baskets, he asked. No, we do not want any, any was the reply. What? exclaimed the Indian as we went out of the gates. Do you mean to starve us? Having seen his industrious white neighbors so well off, that the lawyer had only to weave arguments, and by some magic wealth and standing followed, he had said to himself, I will go into business. I will weave baskets. It's a thing which I can do. Thinking that when he'd made the baskets, he would have done his part, and that it would be the white man to buy them. 
He had not discovered that it was necessary for him to make, the, make it worth the other's while to buy them, or at least make him think that it was so, or to make something else which would be his worthwhile to buy. I, too, had woven a kind of basket of a delicate texture, but had not made it worth anyone's while to buy them. Yet not the less in my case did I think it worth my while to weave them, and instead of studying how to make it worth men's while to buy my baskets, I studied rather how to avoid the necessity of selling them. The life which men praise and regard as successful is but one kind. Why should we exaggerate any one kind at the expense of others? Finding that my fellow citizens were not likely to offer me any room in the courthouse or a curacy or living anywhere else, but I must shift for myself, I turned my face more exclusively than ever to the woods where I was better known. I determined to go into business at once and not wait to acquire the usual capital, using such slender means as I'd already got. My purpose in going to Walden Pond was not to live cheaply nor to live dearly there, but to transact some private business with the fewest obstacles, to be hindered from accomplishing which, for want of a little common sense, a little enterprise and business talent appeared not so sad as foolish. I've always endeavored to inquire strict business habits. They are indispensable to every man. If your trade is with the Celestial Empire, then some small counting house on the coast in some Salem Harbor will be fixture enough. You will export such articles as the country affords, purely native products, much ice and pine timber and a little granite, always in native bottoms. These will be good ventures. To oversee all the details yourself in person, to be at once pilot and captain and owner and underwriter, to buy and sell and keep the accounts, to read every letter received and write or read every letter sent, to superintend the discharge of imports night and day, to be upon many parts of the coast almost at the same time. Often the richest freight will be discharged upon a Jersey shore, to be your own telegraph, unweariedly sweeping the horizon, speaking all passing vessels bound coastwise, to keep up a steady despatch of commodities for the supply of such a distant and exorbitant market, to keep yourself informed of the state of the markets, prospects of war and peace everywhere, and anticipate the tendencies of trade and civilization, taking advantage of the results of all exploring expeditions, using new passages and all improvements in navigation, charts to be studied, the position of reefs and new lights and buoys to be ascertained, and ever and ever the logarithmic tables to be corrected, for by the error of some calculator the vessel often splits upon a rock that should have reached a friendly pier. There is the untold fate of La Perouse. The universal science to be kept pace with, studying the lives of all great discoverers and navigators, great adventurers and merchants from Hanno and the Phoenicians down today. In fine, a count of stock to be taken from time to time, to know how you stand. It is a labor to task the faculties of a man, such problems of profit and loss, of interest, of tear and tret, engaging of all kinds in it, a demand, a universal knowledge. I have thought that Walden Pond would be a good place for business, not solely on account of the railroad and the ice trade. It offers advantages which may not be good, good policy to divulge. It's a good port and a good foundation. No Neva marshes to be filled, though you must everywhere build on piles of your own driving. It is said that a flood tide with a westerly wind and an ice in Neva would sweep St. Petersburg from the face of the earth. As this business is to be entered into without the usual capital, it may not be easy to conjecture where those means that will still be indispensable to every such undertaking were to be obtained. As for clothing, to come at once to the practical part of the question, perhaps were led oftener by the love of novelty and regard of the opinions of men in procuring it than by a true utility. Let him who has work to do recollect that the object of clothing is first to retain the vital heat and secondly, in the state of society, to cover nakedness, and he may judge how much of any necessary or important work may be accomplished without adding to his wardrobe. Kings and queens who wear a suit but once, though made by some tailor or dressmaker to their majesties, cannot know the comfort of wearing a suit that fits. They are no better than wooden horses to hang clean clothes on. Every day our garments become more assimilated to ourselves, receiving the impress of the wearer's character until we hesitate to lay them aside without such delay and medical appliances of such solemnity as even our own bodies. No man ever stood the lower in my estimation for having a patch on his clothes, 
yet I'm sure there's greater anxiety commonly to have a fashionable or at least clean and unpatched clothes than to have a sound conscience. But even if the rent is not mended, perhaps the worst vice betrayed is improvidence. I sometimes try my acquaintances by such tests as this. Who could wear a patch or two extra seams only over the knee? Most behave as they believe that their prospects for life would be ruined if they should do it. It would be easier for them to hobble to town with a broken leg than with a broken pantaloon. Often, if an accident happens to a gentleman's legs, they can be mended. But if a similar accident happens to the legs of his pantaloons, there is no help for it, for he considers not what is truly respectable, but what is respected. We know but few men a great many coats and breeches. Dress a scarecrow in your last shift, and you're standing shiftless by who would not soonest salute the scarecrow. Passing a cornfield the other day, close by a hat and coat on a stake, I recognized the owner of the farm. He was only a little more weather-beaten than when I saw him last. I've heard of a dog that barked at every stranger who approached his master's premises with clothes on, but was easily quieted by a naked thief. It's an interesting question how far men would retain their relative rank if they were divested of their clothes. Could you in such a case tell surely of any company of civilized men which belong to the most respected class? When Madame Pfeiffer, in her adventurous travels round the world from east to west, had got so near home as Asiatic Russia, she says that she felt the necessity of wearing other than a traveling dress when she went to meet the authorities, for she was now in a civilized country, where people are judged of by their clothes. Even in our democratic New England towns, the accidental possession of wealth and its manifestation in dress and equipage alone obtained for the possessor almost universal respect. But they yield such respect, numerous as they are, are so far heathen and need to have a missionary sent to them. Besi besides, clothes induced sewing, introduced sewing, a kind of work in which you may call endless. A woman's dress, at least, is never done. A man who has at length found something to do will not need to get a new suit to do it in. For him, the old will do. That is laying dusty in the garret for an indeterminate period. Old shoes will serve a hero longer than have served his valet, if a hero ever has a valet. Bare feet are older than shoes, and he can make them do. Only they who go to soirees and legislative halls must have new coats, coats to change as often as the man changes in them. But if my jacket and trousers, my hat and shoes, are fit to worship God in, they will do, will they not? Whoever saw his old clothes, his old coat actually worn out, resolved into its primitive elements, so that it was not a deed of charity to bestow on it to some poor boy, by him perchance to be bestowed on some poorer still, or shall we say richer, who could do with less? I say beware of all enterprises that require new clothes, and not rather a new wearer of clothes. If there's not a new man, how can the new clothes be made to fit? If you have any enterprise before you, try it in your old clothes. All men want not something to do with, but something to do, or rather something to be. Perhaps we should never procure a new suit, however ragged or dirty the old, until we have so conducted, so enterprised or sailed in some way, that we feel like new men in the old, and that to retain it would be like keeping new wine in old bottles. Our molting season, like that of the fowls, must be a crisis in our lives. The loon retires to solitary ponds to spend it. Thus also the snake casts its slough and the caterpillar its wormy coat by an internal industry and expansion. For clothes are but our outmost cuticle and mortal coil. Otherwise we shall be found sailing under false colors and be inevitably cashiered at last by our own opinion as well as that of mankind. We don garment after garment as if we grew like exogenous plants by addition without. Our outside and often thin and fanciful clothes are our epidermis, or false skin, which partakes not of our life, and may be stripped off here and there without fatal injury. Our thicker garments constantly worn are our cellular integument, or cortex. But our shirts are our liber, or true bark, which cannot be removed without girdling and so destroying the man. I believe that all races at some seasons wear something equivalent to the shirt. It is desirable that a man be clad so simply that he can lay his hands on himself in the dark, and that he live in all respects so compactly and preparedly that if an enemy take the town, he can, like the old philosopher, walk out the gate empty-handed without anxiety. While one thick garment is for most purposes as good as three thin ones, and cheap clothing can be attained at prices really to suit customers, 
while a thick coat can be bought for five dollars, which will last as many years. Thick pantaloons for two dollars. Cowhide boots for a dollar and a half a pair. A summer hat for a quarter of a dollar. And a winter cap for sixty-two and a half cents. Or a better be made at home for nominal cost, where he is so poor that clad in such a suit of his own earning, there will not be found wise men to do him reverence. When I ask for a garment of a particular form, my tailoress tells me gravely, well, they do not make them so now, not emphasizing the they at all, as if she quoted an authority as impersonal as the fates. And I find it difficult to get made what I want, simply because she cannot believe that I mean what I say, that I am so rash. When I hear this oracular sentence, I am for a moment absorbed in thought, emphasizing to myself each word separately that I may come to the meaning of it, that I may find out by what degree of consanguinity they are related to me and what authority they may have in an affair which affects me so nearly. And finally, I'm inclined to answer her with equal mystery, and without any more emphasis of the they. It is true, they did not make them so recently, but they do now. Of what use this measuring of me does she not measure my character, but only the breadth of my shoulders as it were a peg to hang the coat on? We worship not the graces, nor the parse, but fashion. She spins and weaves and cuts with full authority. The head monkey at Paris puts on a traveler's cap, and all the monkeys in America do the same. I sometimes despair of getting anything quite simple and honest done in this world by the help of men. They would have to be passed through a powerful press first to squeeze their old notions out of them so they would not soon get upon their legs again, and then there'd be someone in the company with a maggot in his head, hatched from an egg deposited there nobody knows when, for not even fire kills these things and you would have lost your labor. Nevertheless, we will not forget that some Egyptian wheat was handed down to us by a mummy. On the whole, I think it cannot be maintained that dressing has, in this or any country, risen to the dignity of an art. At present, men make shift to wear what they can get. Like shipwrecked sailors, they put on what they can find on the beach, and at a little distance, whether of space or time, laugh at each other's masquerade. Every generation laughs at the old fashions, but follows religiously the new. We are amused at beholding the costume of Henry VIII or Queen Elizabeth as much as it was that of king and queens of cannibal islands. All costume off a man is pitiful or grotesque. It is only the serious eye peering and the sincere life passed within it which restrain laughter and consecrate the costume of any people. Let Harlequin be taken with a fit of the colic and his trappings will have to serve that mood too. When the soldier is hit by a cannonball, Rags are as becoming as purple. The childish and savage taste of men and women for new patterns keeps how many shaking and squinting through kaleidoscopes that they may discover the particular figure of which this generation requires today. The manufacturers have learned that this taste is merely whimsical. Of two patterns which differ only by a few threads more or less of a particular color, the one will be sold readily, the other lie on its shelf though it frequently happens that after the lapse of a season, the latter becomes the most fashionable. Comparatively, tattooing is not the hideous custom which it is called. It is not barbarous merely because the printing is skin deep and unalterable. I cannot believe that our factory system is the best mode by which men may get clothing. The condition of the operatives is becoming every day more like that of the English and it cannot be wondered at since, as far as I've heard or observed, the principal object is not that mankind may be well and honestly clad, but unquestionably that corporations may be enriched. In the long run, men hit only at what they aim at. Therefore, they should fail immediately. They had better aim at something high. As for a shelter, I will not deny that this is now a necessary of life, though there are instances of men having done without it for long periods in colder countries than this. Samuel Lang says that the Laplander in his skin dress, and in a skin bag which he puts over his head and shoulders, will sleep night after night on the snow, in a degree of cold which would extinguish the life of one exposed to it in any woolen clothing. He had seen them asleep thus. Yet, he adds, they are not hardier than other people. But probably man did not live long on the earth without discovering the convenience which there is in a house, the domestic comforts, which phrase may have originally signified the satisfactions of the house more than of the family. Though these must be extremely partial and occasional in those climates where the house is associated in our thoughts with winter or the rainy season chiefly, and two-thirds of the year except for a parasol is unnecessary. In our climate, in the summer, 
It was formerly almost solely a covering at night. In the Indian gazettes, a wigwam was the symbol of a day's march, and a row of them cut or painted on the bark of a tree signified that so many times they had camped. Man was not made so large-limbed and robust, but that he, sh he must seek to narrow his world, and a wall in a space such as fitted him. He was at first bare and out of doors, but through this was pleasant enough in serene and warm weather by daylight, the rainy season in the winter, to say nothing of the torrid sun, would perhaps have nipped his race in the bud if he'd not made haste to close and clothe himself with the shelter of a house. Adam and Eve, according to the fable, wore the bower before other clothes. Man wanted a home, a place of warmth or comfort, first a physical warmth and then the warmth of affection. We may imagine a time, then, when the infancy of the human race and some enterprising mortal crept into a hollow in a rock for shelter. Every child begins the world again to some extent, and loves to stay outdoors, even in wet and cold. It plays house as well as horse, having an instinct for it. Who does not remember the, with interest in which the young uh, he looked at shelving rocks or any approach to a cave? It was the natural yearning of that portion of our most primitive ancestor which still survived in us. From the cave we had advanced to roofs or palm leaves, of bark and boughs, of linen woven and stretched, of grass and straw, of boards and shingles, of stones and tiles. At last we, do not, we know not what it is to live in the open air, and our lives are domestic in more senses than we think. From the hearth to the field is a great distance. It would be well, perhaps, if we were to spend more of our days and nights without any obstruction between us and the celestial bodies, if the poet did not speak so much from under a roof, or the saint dwell there so long. Birds do not sing in caves, nor do doves cherish their innocence in dovecots. However, if one designs to construct a dwelling house, it behooves him to exercise a little Yankee shrewdness, lest, after all, he finds himself in a workhouse, a labyrinth without a clue, a museum, an almshouse, a prison, or a splendid mausoleum instead. Consider first how slight a shelter is absolutely necessary. I've seen Penobscot Indians in this town living in tents of thin cotton cloth while the snow was nearly a foot deep around them, and I thought that they'd be glad to have it deeper to keep out the wind. Formerly when how to get my living honestly with freedom left for my proper pursuits was a question which vexed me even more than it does now, for unfortunately I'm become somewhat callous. I used to see a large box by the railroad, six feet long by three wide, in which the laborers locked up their tools at night, and it suggested to me that every man who was hard pushed might get such a one for a dollar, and having bored a few auger holes in it, to admit the air at least, get into it when it rained at night, and hook down the lid, and so have freedom in his love and his, in his soul be free. This did not appear the worst, nor by any means a despicable alternative. You could sit up as late as you pleased, and whenever you got up, go abroad without any landlord or houselord dogging you for rent. Many a man is harassed to death to pay the rent of a larger and more luxurious box who would not have frozen to death in such a box as this. I am far from jesting. Economy is a subject which admits of being treated with levity, but it cannot be so disposed of. A comfortable house for a rude and hardy race that lived mostly out of doors was once made here almost entirely of such materials as nature furnished ready to their hands. Gookin, who was superintendent of the Indians subject to the Massachusetts colony, writing in 1674, says, The best of their houses are covered very neatly, tight and warm with barks of trees, slipped from their bodies at those seasons when the sap is up, and made into great flakes with pressure of weighty timber when they are green. The meaner sort are covered with mats which they make a kind of bulrush, and are also indifferently tight and warm, but not so good as the former. Some I've seen sixty or a hundred feet long and thirty feet broad, and have often lodged in their wigwams and found them as warm as the best English houses. He adds that they were commonly carpeted and lined within with well-wrought embroidered mats, and were furnished with various utensils. The Indians had advanced so far as to regulate the effect of the wind by a mat suspended over the hole in the roof and moved by a string. Such a lodge was in the first instance constructed in a day or two at most, and taken down and put up in a few hours, and every family owned one, or its apartment in one. In the savage state, every family owns a shelter as good as the best, and sufficient for its coarser and simpler wants. But I think that I speak within bounds when I say that, though the birds of the air have their nests, and the foxes their holes, and the savages their wigwams, in modern civilized society not more than one half the families own a shelter. 
In the large towns and cities where civilization especially prevails, the number of those who own a shelter is a very small fraction of the whole. The rest pay an annual tax for this outside garment of all, become indispensable summer and winter, which would buy a village of Indian wigwams, but now helps to keep them poor as long as they live. I do not mean to insist here on the disadvantage of hiring compared with owning, but it's evident that the savage owns his shelter because it costs so little, while the civilized man hires commonly because he cannot afford to own it, nor can he in the long run any better afford to hire. But answers one by merely paying this tax, the poor civilized man secures an abode which is a palace compared with the savages. An annual rent of from twenty-five to a hundred dollars, these are the country rates, and entitles him to the benefit of improvements of centuries, spacious apartments, clean paint and paper, Rumford fireplace, back plastering, Venetian blinds, copper pump, spring lock, a commodious cellar, and many other things. But how happens it that he is who is said to enjoy these things is so commonly a poor civilized man, while the savage who has them not is rich as a savage? If it is asserted that civilization is a real advance in the condition of man, and I think that it is, though only the wise improve their advantages, it must be shown that it has produced better dwellings without making them more costly. And the cost of a thing is the amount of what I will call life, which is required to be exchanged for it, immediately or in the long run. An average house in this neighborhood costs perhaps $800, and to lay up this sum will take from 10 to 15 years of the laborer's life, even if he's not encumbered with a family. Estimating the pecuniary value of every man's labor at one dollar a day, for if some receive more, others receive less, so that he must have spent more than half his life commonly before his wigwam will be earned. If we suppose him to pay a rent instead, this is but a doubtful choice of evils. Would the savage have been wise to exchange his wigwam for a palace on these terms? It may be guessed that I reduce almost the whole advantage of holding this superfluous property as a fund in store against the future, so far as the individual is concerned, mainly to the refrain of funeral expenses. But perhaps a man is not required to bury himself. Nevertheless, this points to an important distinction between the civilized man and the savage, and no doubt they have designs on us for our benefit and making the life of a civilized people an institution in which the life of the individual is to a great extent absorbed in order to preserve and perfect that of the race. But I wish to show at what sacrifice this advantage is at present obtained and to suggest that we may possibly so live as to secure all the advantage without suffering any of the disadvantage. What mean ye by saying the poor ye always have with you, or that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father. So also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. When I consider my neighbors, the farmers of Concord, who are at least as well off as the other classes, I find that for the most part they have been toiling twenty, thirty, or forty years that they may become the real owners of their farms, which commonly they have inherited with encumbrances, or else bought with hired money, and we may regard one-third of that toil as the cost of their houses, but commonly they have not paid for them yet. It is true, the encumbrances sometimes outweigh the value of the farm, so that the farm itself becomes one great encumbrance, and still a man is found to inherit it, being well acquainted with it, as he says. On applying to the assessors, I'm surprised to learn they cannot at once name a dozen in the town who own their own farms free and clear. If you would know the history of these homesteads, inquire at the bank where they are mortgaged. The man who's actually paid for his farm with labor on it is so rare that every neighbor can point to him. I doubt if there are three such men in Concord. What has been said of the merchants, that a very large majority, even 97 in 100, are sure to fail, is equally true of the farmers. With regard to the merchants, however, one of them says pertinently that a great part of their failures are not genuine pecuniary failures, but merely failures to fulfill their engagements, because it's inconvenient. That is, it is the moral character that breaks down. But this puts an infinitely worse face on the matter, and suggests, besides, that probably not even the other three succeed in saving their souls, but are perchance bankrupt in a worse sense than those who fail honestly. Bankruptcy and repudiation are the springboards from which much of our civilization vaults and turns its somersets. But the savage stands on the unelastic plank of famine. 
Yet the Middlesex Cattle Show goes off here with eclat annually, as if all the joints of the agricultural machine were suant. The farmer is endeavoring to solve the problem of a livelihood by a formula more complicated than the problem itself. To get his shoestrings, he speculates in herds of cattle. With consummate skill, he has set his trap with a hair spring to catch comfort and independence, and then, as he turned away, got his own leg into it. This is the reason he is poor, and for a similar reason we're all poor in respect to a thousand savage comforts, though surrounded by luxuries. As Chapman sings, The false society of men, for earthly greatness, all heavenly comforts, rarefies to air. And when the farmer has got his house, he may not be the richer, but the poorer for it, and it be the house that has got him. As I understand it, that was a valid objection urged by Momus against the house which Minerva made, that she had not made it movable, by which means a bad neighborhood might be avoided. And it may still be urged, for our houses are such unwieldy property that were often imprisoned rather than housed in them, and the bad neighborhood to be avoided is our own scurvy selves. I know one or two families, at least in this town, who for nearly a generation have been wishing to sell their houses in the outskirts and move into the village but have not been able to accomplish it, and only death will set them free. Granted that the majority are able at last to either own or hire the modern house with all its improvements. While civilization has been improving our houses, it has not equally improved the men who are to inhabit them. It has created palaces, but it was not so easy to create noblemen and kings. And if the civilized man's pursuits are no worthier than the savages, if he's employed the greater part of his life in obtaining gross necessaries and comforts merely, why should he have a better dwelling than the former? But how do the poor minority fare? Perhaps it will be found that just in proportion as some have been placed in outward circumstances above the savage, others have been degraded below him. The luxury of one class is counterbalanced by the indigence of another. On the one side is the palace, on the other are the almshouse and the silent poor. The myriads who built the pyramids to the tombs of the pharaohs were fed on garlic, and it may be were not decently buried themselves. The mason who finishes the cornice of the palace returns at night perchance to a hut, not so good as a wigwam. It is a mistake to suppose that in a country where usual evidences of civilization exist, the condition of a very large body of the inhabitants may not be as degraded as that of savages. I refer to the degraded poor, not now to the degraded rich. To know this, I should not need to look farther than to the shanties which everywhere border our railroads, that last improvement in civilization, where I see in my daily walks human beings living in styes, and all winter with an open door for the sake of light, without any visible, often imaginable woodpile, and the forms of both old and young are permanently contracted by the long habit of shrinking from cold and misery, and the development of all their limbs and faculties is checked. It certainly is fair to look at that class by whose labor the works which distinguish this generation are accomplished. Such, too, to a greater or less extent, is the condition of the operatives of every denomination in England, which is the great workhouse of the world. Or I could refer you to Ireland, which is marked as one of the white or enlightened spots on the map. Contrast the physical condition of the Irish with that of the North American Indian, or the South Sea Islander, or any other savage race before it was degraded by a contact with the civilized man. Yet I have no doubt that the people's rulers are as wise as the average of civilized rulers. Their condition only proves what squalidness may consist with civilization. I hardly need refer now to the laborers in our southern states, who produce the staple exports of this country, and are themselves a staple production of the South but to confine myself to those who are said to be in moderate circumstances. Most men appear never to have considered what a house is, and are actually, though needlessly, poor all their lives because they think they must have such a one as their neighbors have. As if one were to wear any sort of coat which the tailor might cut out for him, or gradually leaving off palm leaf hat or cap or woodchuck skin, complain at hard times because he could not afford to buy him a crown. It is possible to invent a house still more convenient and luxurious than we have, which yet all would admit that man could not afford to pay for. Shall we always study to obtain more of these things, and not sometimes to be content with less? Shall we be respectable citizens thus gravely teach by precept and example the necessity of the young man's providing a certain number of superfluous glow shoes and umbrellas and empty guest chambers for empty guests before he dies? 
Why should not our furniture be as simple as the Arabs or the Indians? When I think of the benefactors of the race, whom we've apothesized as messengers from heaven, think of the benefactor uh, bears the divine gifts to man. I do not see in my mind any retinue of their heels, any carload of fashionable furniture. Or what if I were to allow, would it not be a singular allowance, that our furniture should be more complex than the Arabs in proportion as we are morally and intellectually his superiors? Well, at present, our houses are cluttered and defiled with it, and a good housewife would sweep out the greater part into the dust hole and not leave her morning's work undone. Morning work. By the blushes of Aurora and the music of Memnon, what should be man's morning work in this world? I had three pieces of limestone on my desk, but I was terrified to find that they required to be dusted daily, when the furniture of my mind was all undusted still, and I threw them out the window in disgust. How, then, could I have a furnished house? I would rather sit in the open air, for no dust gathers on the grass, unless where man has broken ground. It is the luxurious and dissipated who set the fashions which the herd so diligently follow. The traveler who stops the best houses, so-called, soon discovers this, for the publicans presume him to be a Sardanopolis, and if he resigned himself to their tender mercies, he would soon be completely emasculated. I think that in the railroad car we are inclined to spend more on luxury than on safety and convenience, and it threatens without attaining these to be no better than the modern drawing room, with its divans, its ottomans and sunshades, and a hundred other oriental things which we are taking west with us, invented for the ladies of the harem and effeminate natives of the celestial empire, which Jonathan should be ashamed to know the names of. I would rather sit on a pumpkin and have it all to myself than be crowded on a velvet cushion. I would rather ride on earth in an ox cart with a free circulation than to go to heaven in the fancy car of an excursion train and breathe a malaria all the way. The very simplicity and nakedness of man's life in the primitive ages imply this advantage at least, that they left him with but a still a sojourner in nature. When he was refreshed with food and sleep, he contemplated his journey again. He dwelt, as it were, in a tent in this world, and was either threading the valleys or crossing the plains or climbing the mountain tops. But lo, men have become the tools of their tools. The man who independently plucked the fruits when he was hungry is become a farmer, and he who stood under a tree for shelter, a housekeeper. We now no longer camp as for a night, but have settled down on earth and forgotten heaven. We've adopted Christianity merely as an improved method of agriculture. We've built for this world a family mansion, and for the next, a family tomb. The best works of art are the expression of man's struggle to free himself from this condition. But the effect of our art is merely to make this low state comfortable and that higher state to be forgotten. There is actually no place in this village for a work of fine art, if any had come down to us, to stand for our lives, our houses and streets, furnish no proper pedestal for it. There is not a nail to hang a picture on, nor a shelf to receive the bust of a hero or a saint. When I consider how our houses are built and paid for, or not paid for, and their internal economy managed and sustained, I wonder that the floor does not give way under the visitor while he's admiring the, ju the jujas upon the mantelpiece, and let them through the cellar to some solid and honest, though earthly, foundation. I cannot but perceive that this so-called rich and refined life is a thing jumped at, and I do not get on in the enjoyment of the fine arts which adorn it my attention being wholly occupied with the jump. For I remember that the greatest genuine leap, due to human muscles alone on record, is that of certain wandering Arabs, who have said to have cleared 25 feet on level ground. Without fictitious support, man is sure to come to earth again beyond that distance. The first question which I am tempted to put to the proprietor of such great impropriety is, who bolsters you? Are you one of the 97 who fail, or one of the three who succeed? Answer me these questions, and then perhaps I may look at your uh, baubles and find them ornamental. The cart before the horse is neither beautiful nor useful. Before we can adorn our houses with beautiful objects, the walls must be stripped, and our lives must be stripped, and beautiful housekeeping and beautiful living be laid for a foundation. Now a taste for the beautiful is the most cultivated out of doors, where there's no house and no housekeeper. Old Johnson, in his wonder-working providence, speaking of the first settlers of this town with whom he was a contemporary, tells us that they burrow themselves in the earth for their first shelter under some hillside, and, casting the soil loft upon timber, they make a smoky fire against the earth at the highest side. 
They did not provide them houses, says he, till the earth by the Lord's blessing brought forth bread to feed them. And the first year's crop was so light that they were forced to cut their bread very thin for a long season. The Secretary of the Providence of New Netherland, writing in Dutch in 1650, for the information of those who wish to take up land there, states more particularly that those in New Netherland, and especially New England, who have no means to build farmhouses at first according to their wishes, dig a square pit in the ground, cellar fashion six or seven feet deep, as long and as broad as they think proper, case the earth inside with wood all round the wall, and line the wood with the bark of trees or something else to prevent the caving in of the earth. Floor this cellar with plank and wainscot it overhead for a ceiling. Raise a roof of spars clear up, and cover the spars with bark or green sods so they can live dry and warm in these houses with their entire families for two, three, and four years, it being understood that partitions are run through those cellars which are adapted to the size of the family. The wealthy and principal men in New England, in the beginning of the colonies, commenced their first dwelling houses in this fashion for two reasons. Firstly, in order not to waste time in the building, and not to want food for the next season. Secondly, in order not to discourage poor laboring people whom they brought over in numbers from the fatherland. In the course of three or four years, when the country became adapted to agriculture, they built themselves handsome houses, spending on them several thousands. In this course which our ancestors took, there was a show of prudence, at least, as if their principle were to satisfy more pressing wants first. But are the more pressing wants satisfied now? When I think of acquiring for myself one of our luxurious dwellings, I am deterred for, so to speak, the country is not yet adapted to human culture, and we're still forced to cut our spiritual bread far thinner than our forefathers did their wheaten. Not that all architectural ornament is to be neglected even in the rudest of periods, but let our houses first be lined with beauty where they come in contact with our lives, like the tenement of the shellfish, and not overlaid with it. But alas, I've been inside one or two of them, and know what they are lined with. Though we're not so degenerate that we might possibly live in a cave or a wigwam or wear skins today, it is certainly better to accept in the advantages those so dearly bought which the invention and industry of mankind offer. In such a neighborhood as this, boards and shingles, lime and bricks are cheaper and more easily obtained than suitable caves or whole logs or bark in sufficient quantities or even well-tempered clay or flat stones. I speak understandingly on this subject, for I've made myself acquainted with it both theoretically and practically. With a little more wit we might use these materials so as to become richer and the, than the richest are now, and make our civilization a blessing. A civilized man is more experienced and wiser savage. But, to make haste, to my own experiment. <laughs>